Sure, Ajam. Welcome again. Uh, okay, Bismillah. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, once again to our session in which we started at the Ilayat on the International Speaker Series. Today, I am very grateful that a good friend of mine and colleague and a wonderful academic, Professor Jonathan Brown, who most of you probably already know, but if you don't, um, I'm gonna quickly go through the bio. Not that it's necessary, but I just think that that's what we ought to do. Um, so uh, Professor Brown is uh, the Al-Walid bin Talal Chair of Islamic Civilization in the School of Foreign Services at Georgetown. And he did his BA in history at Georgetown University and then got a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Chicago. He's the publisher of many books and many works of which more recent, some of you may know on his works on Hadith and more particularly on uh, Rasul Salam, so Muhammad, a short uh, introduction. But more recently, Professor Brown has um, indulged in works in regards to Islam and slavery and Islam and blackness, um, which, um, I think was supposed to come out this year or has come out this year. I'm not too sure. This year has been a very difficult one. Uh, I mean, it's out. The book is physically out. I don't know when it's going to go into stores, but I mean, okay. it's uh, like it physically exists now. Okay, fantastic. So um, is, what we're going to do today is we're going to cover some of these topics uh, as a way of um, interacting with uh, Professor Brown. Um, what we'll do is we'll have a 40 minute session in which Professor Brown and I will have a conversation so you guys can listen attentively. And then we'll open up the last 20 minutes for a Q and A, um, if that's okay. Once again, thank you very much for everyone for being here. I really appreciate it on a personal level that so many of us are willing to uh, share and partake in the study of ilm. It's something that is part of our tradition and culture. And I hope that this continues. And I'm really grateful that Professor Brown has this, has chosen to be the first speaker of this semester in terms of this session. So thank you very much, Professor Brown, and Salam alaikum. Uh, okay. All right. So let's 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 begin. So one of the interesting things that I found in terms of your work and in terms of your life journey, somebody who myself who writes was working on biographies and so forth, is that traditionally Muslims who have entered Islam and decided to study Islam have gone down the traditional route of going to the Azhar or to Medina and so forth, but you chose the route of academia and you chose that you wanted to be an academic. And what, what I wanted to know is what was your choices very early on in your life about going down that direction? Yeah, well, that's actually a really interesting way to put it. Um, I mean, I, it's, so I, I became Muslim when I was 19. Um, I was, the, basically I started to learn about Islam the, in the second semester of my first year of college. So I was, uh, you know, 18. And then that summer, I thought a lot about it. And when I went back to school in the fall, I uh, became Muslim. You know, I formally became Muslim. I think it was like October of that year. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I learned about Islam through like, hang on, is there, I can hear my own voice. Is that my computer or someone else's computer? I'm not, I'm not trying to be like a, a diva. Oh, no, we're, we're on mute, so it's probably you. Really? I don't know if I should do. Maybe I should just reduce the volume of my computer. Sorry, this is not very interesting, but uh, maybe I'll try this. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Uh, so I, I, be, I became, when I, became, I learned about Islam, I really learned about it through um, reading books of Fazl Rahman and Muhammad Asad. Uh, we, we read in that class I took on Islam when I was a freshman, we read, you know, Fazl Rahman's book on Islam. We read uh, Muhammad Asad's translation of the Quran, and we read Muhammad Asad's Road to Mecca. Um, and so Muhammad Asad, or uh, Himahu Allah, is you know, um, in some ways, quote unquote, conservative, you know, I think he'd probably be considered uh, politically conservative today in the sense of being, you know, an Islamist. Um, but he was, in terms of his like theology and his fiqh, he was, or more even in his theology, I think he was very, quote unquote, liberal, right? So he was, his, his law might not have been actually, his fiqh might have been, he was like sometimes sort of, been described as Zahiri. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to reduce the volume of my computer. Again. Okay, so maybe this will help. So, uh, in terms of his uh, his fiqh, who was like more 
maybe not so maybe a little bit Zahiri, but where I think he was really kind of un, quote unquote un, unorthodox for lack of a better word is in his theology, his uh, opinions on jinn, his opinion on um, you know things like you know punishment of the grave and a lot of these. He was sort of a, a very almost like an extreme early Mu'tazilite, I think. But the, my, my point about all this is, is when I learned about Islam, I learned about it really from a essentially Islamic modernist perspective, basically, right? Um, and I didn't really know about um, like traditional Islamic scholarship. Like when, 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 when I read about it, so I, and then I, I read the, the other classes I took from one Muslim professor who really influenced me a lot. Her name was Haifa Khalafallah. She, uh, I actually dedicated my most recent book to the professor who taught me the first class on Islam, Mason al Faruqi, and then Haifa Khalafala, and then also my grad student advisor, Wadad al Qadi. But the, so, Professor Khalafala, she really she was doing her dissertation on Muhammad al Ghazali, the scholar who died in 1996, the Egyptian scholar. And, you know, Muhammad al Ghazali, Rahimahullah, was also, he wasn't necessarily, he was a modernist, but he was uh, really maybe um, kind of a wasati. Uh, men hedge, but uh, maybe like a, a continuation of Mahmoud Shaltut, Rahimahullah, or um, uh, maybe like R Rashid Ridda a little bit. And, and so, uh, and Sheikh Qaradawi, Rahimahullah. So it's like he was, um, he was traditional in the sense that he came from the kind of the traditional ulum. He functioned within the tradition of fiqh and usul. Uh, but he was not, you know, bound to a medheb. Like he was a little bit more iconoclastic, more willing to like go between medhebs or even question uh, positions that he felt had been wrongly taken, um, as as also Sheikh Qadawi would sometimes do, right? But my point is that uh, I didn't, you know, everything I knew about Islam, I knew from either Islam, kind of Islamic modernist, or maybe we could call it sort of re reformist, uh, slightly reformist traditional view so i didn't actually know that like when i when you if you read books like this right uh, the ulama are usually it's usually like they're talked about as this bunch of idiots they're sort of they're either stupid or they are they're kind of stubborn and they need to reform um they're often talked about in the past tense they're, they're sort of like this this historical either they're historically you know, just uh, extinct, or they're essentially a relic of the past that needs that is not has no real role in the present in their current state. If they want to be involved, they have to reform, you know, quote unquote, reform or something, right? So um, that's really I didn't understand that you could actually go and learn from Muslim scholars in a way that would be, be productive. So I, I was really when I was in um, going to Egypt to study Arabic. By the way, I'm sorry if I'm like taking a long time to tell you the story, but I think it's actually interesting. I mean, I think it's no, 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 I think it's great. It has so I guess what I'm trying to say is I actually didn't know you could go to Syria or Egypt or Mauritania or anywhere like that and study. Like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf was just kind of becoming famous. Um, you know, I just heard like him give a lecture once at a talk. I didn't ever I didn't know anything about his life. I didn't know he'd studied in Mauritania. I didn't know you could do this stuff. Maybe I should have just you know, done more reading or something. But so my point is that I, I really, I had a very, um, and that, that the attitude of a kind of Islamic modernist perspective really, I, I, it wasn't just that that's how I learned about Islam, it really influenced me in the sense that I, I considered the, the obligation to reform to be essential. And I looked at that kind of traditional Muslim world, quote unquote, from perspective, essentially, I, I was con condescending towards it, right? Um, so uh, when I went to Egypt to study Arabic for a full year in this program called CASA, which is just like basically 24 hour Arabic for one for 12 months in Cairo, um, my professor, uh, Professor Khalifala said, okay, go, when you go, go to Al-Azhar and there's a sheikh there named Ali Juma, and you're gonna go and you know, tell him I sent you and you're gonna go and you should attend his lessons. So I, you know, I did that. And I started to, uh, and I was like learning Arabic. I, mean, I really, I, I, I could almost speak almost no Arabic when I got there. So I was learning Arabic as I, as I did this. But I sort of got to know uh, some of the, the Sheikh Ali Juma and then his senior students as well, uh, like uh, Ahmed Zahir Salim and uh, Sheikh Ahmed Ifad, and 
Sheikh Osama Mahmoud, Osama Sayyid Mahmoud al Azhari, and Sayyid Shal Tooth and others. So I, uh, when I went, when I finished my, when I finished that year in Cairo, I went to apply to graduate school in the U.S. And it, it didn't actually occur to me. I mean, this is, I'm sorry to give you a bad answer to your question. But it never actually occurred to me to go and study, quote unquote, traditionally, because I didn't know that you could do this. Like, I didn't know there's something that actually, I mean, for me, it was just obvious that I wanted to keep learning about my, my I wanted to keep learning about Islam. Uh, that's all I knew. I didn't have a plan. I wasn't planning to become a professor. I, I wasn't really thinking ahead. I was just knew I wanted to keep doing what I was doing. And it's the only step that seemed to exist was to apply to PhD programs. Uh, so I applied to PhD programs in the US, went to University of Chicago. And the first year I, um, uh, what happened? The first year in the summer, I, was, I wanted to go to Iran to study Persian, but um, the, I didn't get my visa. And so I, I said, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to Egypt. And I'm just going to go to these Azhar Drus and I'm going to like, whatever, try and benefit, whatever, something, something. And so I went and I spent, I think that summer about a month and a half or two months in Cairo. And I just went every day to these open Drus in the Azhar Mosque with Sheikh Ali Juma and others. And I was just like blown, I was blown away. I mean, I really completely changed my perspective because what I realized, now look, I, I actually want to be really clear. I don't agree with like Sheikh Ali Jamal politically. I don't agree with most of his students politically. I completely disagree with them. But, you know, I would, it would be complete, it would be a complete lie if I said that I didn't think they were extremely knowledgeable. I mean, there are the, some of, like Sheikh Ali Jamal, Sheikh Osama, Sayyid Mahmoud, I really don't agree with them politically, but they're some of the smartest people I ever met in my life and definitely most knowledgeable people I ever met. Like, and I just, I cannot, there's nothing, um, maybe someone like uh, Sheikh uh, Deddu would be some, some like, but just in the, the, the amount of material they have in their minds and the amount, their ability to draw on it and focus it in different kind of analytical processes as just, uh, I mean, I was, I felt like a worm you know, I felt like a little worm on the ground in front of them. And that, what I realized, I was like, I was like, oh, okay, well, yeah, you know, you in the East, quote unquote, you like memorize stuff, but I'm from the West, quote unquote, and I have an analytical reasoning, right? So, I mean, I mean this is literally the stuff I was thinking, right? I mean, that's like actually how I was thinking. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing to say that now. But then I would be like, well, like, you know, let me analyze this. And, you know, you're, you, and then they would just like turn me into pulp. They would just, obliterate me they would they would they would demonstrate how i was the one who had failed to, to reason properly and they do they do so using these like traditional like kawaid kawaid uh ilmiya kawaid um uh what you would call like you know mantiqiyya wa fikriya and things like qiyasiyya like they would just um really completely dismantle my view of the world you know of my of myself and of the world and when I came back to grad school that summer, so starting my second year of PhD, I was, I had a completely different view on the world. And it was before that I had always been like embarrassed to be Muslim. I, I didn't want people to know I was Muslim. I was sort of hide it. I wouldn't, um, you know, people would kind of say snarky things about Islam and I'd be like, ha, 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 you know, eh. um, and what I realized during that summer in Egypt was like, holy moly, like this is being Muslim is not a liability, a liability. Being Muslim is a, is a massive asset. Like this is like these, you know, I, I, I was sitting in class and people would be like reading Arabic texts and, you know, not really understanding them. And then they would not really know like the Quran. They wouldn't know Hadith. They wouldn't know, you know, poetry. They wouldn't know fiqh. They wouldn't know uh, all this stuff. And yet they were, this was supposed to be like the, the pinnacle of, of learning about Islam, but what I realized is like all that stuff was just basic. It was not was just taken for granted amongst senior scholars in the, the traditional circles. Like that was just they, this was like child's play to them, you know. And it even limited exposure to those traditional scholars had given me capacities and knowledge that 
I just felt like, oh my God, like this is, this is actually, I'm, I'm, I have an advantage. You know, this is, this is something that, that makes, that it has made me a better scholar than I ever would have been before. Right. I'll ask you a question uh, on this. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Do you want to ask? Uh, yeah. What I find interesting about the, your life journey so far in this part of it, which is interesting, is that your introduction to Islam is, has been ilm itself. It's been knowledge. I mean, usually people will say, I met a particular person. I met this guy at the mosque, he, but your interaction from the inception has been something you read, a character who was probably a charismatic writer, charismatic person in Islam, someone like Muhammad Asad and Fadl Rahman, and then you go to Egypt, and once again, you're, you're dealing with this meta institution who are the ulama, who are ilm-based and so forth, and that seems to be how you interact with Islam, which is fascinating for me, because once you interact with that sort of like knowledge base, you then took it upon yourself to say, you know what, I'm not ashamed to be Muslim. In fact, I'm going to now take this and I'm now going to defend it or not necessarily defend it, but go back to academia and then say, OK, this is how I'm going to now do. Academia. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's I mean, I, I understand what you say when you mean when you say defend it. But I think that like it doesn't need defending because it's it, it's it's it defends itself if it's deployed properly. Right. I mean. It only needs defending if the people if the people who are talking about it have an audience that doesn't know what it is, right? Now, of course, and, and this is you know, look, if you go to Azhar and you grab you know the first ninety people you meet, they're probably going to be stupid. Like I mean, and that's that that's true. By the way, of if you go to American University, you grab ninety people off the campus, they're probably going to be, you know, not, they're not going to be the top minds at the university, right? And it's just, that's just statistically likely. Um, at a place like Azhar, as you know, in, in, in like, or in Pakistan or Egypt or other places, you know, people who are really talented usually don't go into these sciences, they, they go into other fields. So, but, you know, you don't judge the Islamic sciences by the average person you judge them by the excellence by people who are excellent examples right and so that's what i was very fortunate and i i stumbled i stumbled into it you know just you know ass backwards or whatever as they say like i mean i just totally stumbled into it i had no idea what i was doing i just happened to meet people who are amazing examples of this tradition and so that really uh what i realized is like that's this is not to be a being a good learning to be a good muslim scholar is not something that just is about Islamic scholarship. It's about, that means being a good thinker. It means being a good historian. It means being a good editor of manuscripts. It means being a good um, critical reasoner. It means being a good debater, right? So uh, what, I, what I realized was that what I wanted to do is be a good Muslim scholar because that was also, I mean, that was also to be a good scholar in general, even in that academy. And so from that point on, <clears throat> everything I did was really trying to meet that level of excellence that I'd seen from these from these scholars, and um, to, to, I mean, yeah, like when you write an article for, um, you know, Islamic Law and Society or something, probably the you know, premier journal on Islamic law in um, in the West, right? If you if you write an article for that you don't start out by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Masad, you know, like, and you don't say, um, you know, Ibn Hajar, Rahimahullah, did like you don't. Know, but you, but almost everything else in my scholarship, I don't think actually would be different if it were, if, if I were Muslim or not Muslim, you know, it, it, I think, um, I think a lot of these sort of faith inflections or faith based elements are really products of studying early Islamic history. Like if you study early Islamic history, then you're going to be wrapped up in a lot of um, presumptions, everybody who goes into that, whether they're Muslim or not Muslim or whatever, is going in with a lot of presumptions and reading their own worldview into a history that you can, you, you, you have to be reconstructing, right? We don't actually have someone who's sitting there during the time of the prophet writing down like today, the prophet did this, and then puts it in a sealed box. And like, you know, we pick it up 1400 years later, right? So we don't, we're, but, uh, I mean, once you get to the, the let's say time of, you know, the, the Muatta or the, the sort of late uh, second century Hijri, late, you know, mid 700s of the common era. At that point, I mean, you have text and like, you know, you can interpret text this way or you can interpret text that way, but, you know, no, being Muslim or not Muslim is not going to change. Like, you're, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, someone who has faith doesn't like read 
the uh, mabstut of a sarachsi and you know and say because i'm muslim i, I say you know like you're obviously your, your perspective is going to influence you but the data itself the material you're looking at doesn't change for the muslim or a non-muslim right so can i ask something on that then? yeah go ahead what's interesting is when we look at hadith literature itself that is usually muslims are very closely guarded in the hadith literature that is something which is instructive in their life that is something that gives them meaning that is something that they they implement and in regards to hadith literature in academia i mean one of your earlier works is misquoted muhammad clearly you were aware that there is some sort of misconception in the way that the hadith literature is being presented and so forth in that sense do you feel that the way that hadith is looked at by scholars who may not be muslim or the infrastructure that has doesn't have the same level of interaction or decorum regarding the hadith literature that the outcome in of itself lends to it to be in yeah definitely right so you know when you're looking at hadith that's i consider that part of early islamic history um but there's a so i don't i've written i almost have written i've written almost nothing about early islamic history and hadith right so what i mean is that everything I almost everything I've written about Islamic thought or hadith is actually about hadith after the time of let's say the Muatta, right so I don't really I don't I'm just not interested I mean I, I like for example my introduction to hadith book I spent a long time the whole chapter on western the western methodology for the study of Islamic history and I you know I take issue with certain things and I give my opinion on certain things right but I'm, I'm, I'm not engaged in these debates because I find them to be, uh, this is essentially a theater for people, this is a theater of polemics, right? This is where people basically go and one group of people is saying, Islam is not special, Islam is not authentic, Islam is not intact, Islam is blah, 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 whatever, like the different things they wanna say. And they're just using pieces of, they're just, putting like Mr. Potato Head pieces together to make that argument. And then other people are going in saying Islam is authentic, Islam is intact, Islam is special, and they're doing their argument, right? But neither of these two groups is able to demonstrate to the other group that they're correct based on evidence that the other group would accept, right? So for me, I'm, I'm not, look, I'm happy for people who wanna do that, God bless them, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not how I, I just find that to be a not a super useful waste of time, a super use of time. Again, I have written about that in my very short introduction to the Prophet. I have written about it a little bit in my book on Hadith. But if you, in my books, so let's say Misquoting Muhammad or it's the Slavery book or the Islam and Blackness book, I spent almost no time on the issue of the authenticity question because I find it to be, um, look, we have the Quran. There's no real debate about that. We have the basic outlines of the Prophet's life, alayhi salatu salam, are evident in non-Muslim sources, right? So after that like okay once you put that aside as as settled then you know okay uh if 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 a muslim if, if a non-muslim thinks the prophet didn't say this or i think the prophet did say this that's fine but i'm i'm not interested what i'm interested in is how muslims understand their religion so my book misquoting muhammad i mean that the title is actually just there because the publisher thought it would make money like that so they, they just gave me a contract they said write a book called misquoting muhammad like we don't, we don't care what's in the book but this is the title right the actual title for me of the book is the subtitle, which is the, the challenges and choices of interpreting the prophet's legacy. It's really about how Muslims have engaged in understanding their religion over the centuries and how, what challenges they've faced, especially with modernity, et cetera. So I don't, uh, I don't really feel that, uh, for me at least, I don't find a lot of um, value in engaging in the wrangling over the authenticity question on hadith I, on, on the quran i think it's relatively i mean i think it's settled i don't uh, feel the need to engage in that a lot other people have right uh, have already done the work but the hadith stuff it's sort of um, in, it's kind of fruitless can i ask you a question then in terms of your work and, and your career and so forth have you seen because you said you wrote misquoting muhammad for muslims and i'm assuming even the other works that you're writing even though it's within a particular Western academic framework which is written in English, but it is aimed for a Muslim audience who can read what you're saying or even read between the lines. It's, it's something that they can pick up and it can empower them in a particular way where you actually are, are speaking to them. Have you found in the Muslim world in particular, in terms of their interaction with your work, 
how things have maybe changed where Muslims in, in academia in particular are now writing works on hadith and it's having an impact in the Muslim world, whereas usually authenticity is assumed where knowledge is coming from the Muslim world. Yeah. Um, so I would say, well, first of all, I would say a couple of things. One is, you know, when Muslim scholars, you know, when Al-Ghazali or Ibn Rushd or... Um, like Ibn Taymiyyah, or, you know, when these scholars are writing, I don't think they thought of themselves as like, I'm writing for Muslims, not non-Muslims, but they were writing with ilm. And when they say ilm, they don't say like ilm islami. They say, this is knowledge, right? That, and the rules that they use to analyze and collect and parse and reason, they see as actually universal, I mean, essentially universal rules, right? Um, and I think they were mostly correct about that. Uh, so I, I really, what I tried to do in my, after I wrote my first three books is when I wrote the Misquoting Muhammad book, what I really wanted to do was to say, I want to write, I want to be like these guys. I want to write a book that's, yes, it's about the Islamic tradition. Yes, it's going to be helpful for Muslims. But what I, I really want to do is I want to show the world how Muslims have thought about big questions and i want people to read this who are not muslim and say hey i'm learning about islam and i'm learning about the way muslim scholars thought and stuff like that but also i wanted them to read it and say like hey this is actually hey this is how this, this is an interesting way to think about free will or this is an interesting way to think about um the role of law in society and to what extent law is supposed to shape society versus shaped by society or to what extent you know what is truth you know is it if, if your kid comes and asks you a question, you tell them a lie because that's the best thing to tell them at that moment. Is that a betrayal of truth or not? Like these are these are big questions that have have vexed humans throughout history, and Muslims have answers to those questions, or they have ways of approaching those questions. What I wanted to do is to say Muslims are involved in all these conversations, and here's here's like an example of their of their contribution. So it, in some ways, I wanted to try and live out or channel, um, you know, inhabit the, the, the confidence of, of a person like uh, Al-Ghazali or Ibn Taymiyyah and show, offer that as an example to a broader audience, both Muslim and non-Muslim. And then similarly with things like the slavery book, like this is, I mean, what, what really, what motivated me, what like drove me to write that book, it was like the fuel for me to write that book was, what I saw is like the incredible um, closed mindedness and uh, willful ignorance that was embraced by academics, not not Muslim, not necessarily Muslim academics, academics, period, on this topic, right? And the public square, period, on this topic. And so I think that my my book on slavery, I, I actually think, I mean, it's really interesting if you want to learn about Islam and slavery, but for me, the core of the book is actually the part to deal with the ethical, what is the historical, moral, historical, and epistemological consequences of the way we talk about this, about slavery for our worldview and where we get our values and what we think about our species and our future and our past, right? And that is, the, I think this is actually just as applicable to non-Muslims as it is to Muslims. Um, so that was, you know, for me, like the, the, it was more of a, of a contribution to discussions around, you know, history of morality and slavery generally. The Islamic part was just uh, like added on as you know, to, to make what I thought was like a, a complete contribution. Similarly, the issue of, of, of Islam and blackness, like there, a lot of that book is designed to... Oh, sorry, did I interrupt you? Yeah, sorry, John, just these two points, because I find it interesting in terms of these last two books that you worked on, just the notion of ethics and morality, something which is coming up more and more in Islamic studies, and by many Muslim scholars in particular, trying to raise the question of the idea of ethics and morality, both in terms of grappling with it in the contemporary world that we live in, in regards to some of the challenges we're facing, just not only in regards to Islam and and the lived experience, but generally the sort of like fissures that exist in the world today, but also trying to go back into the tradition and sort of 
speak about ethics and morality again. Are you finding that that's taking place in regards to the current place we're in in academia at the moment? So, I mean, in some ways, there's two. There's sort of a debate here, which is big in in the West as well. It's just sort of like, what is the role of, a, of an academic? I mean, in or take, take what is the role of, let's say, like religious studies, which I don't have a lot of affection for, but um, is a good example for this. For this, right? So, one argument is that you know academics are supposed to explain, understand, explain things that they kind of they stand outside of what they're studying and they what they're studying is sort of um by the fact that it is being studied is sort of lesser than them it's something that is either part of the past it's been superseded by the present or it's been superseded by a better version of thinking and spirit you know thinking about life the meaning of life and all this stuff right so um and that you kind of have to be objective about that and that you're not our job is not to you know um our job is not to teach islam to people but to teach people how islam as a religious tradition developed et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right the other argument is this sort of activist approach which is that you actually want to teach you know, the job of a professor is to sort of teach truth to people and almost like preach to them now of course if you think about western universities you can it's not doesn't take a long time to, to think about what that truth can and can't be right i can't come out and say like i am here to tell you that we must all do jihad like like you know you can imagine that's not going to be uh, acceptable understanding of islam right so uh, but if i come out and say islam is just about like everybody's a good person and we need to everybody has to embrace their their own truth and about like sexuality and like identity and all this stuff like if i come out and say that and it's all like capitalism sucks and you know down with the man if i come out and say that everyone's like, wow like this is just like really good you know this is terrific so um when i when you when people talk about like essentially like doing theology in the academy you can imagine what most of that quote unquote theology or that preaching is actually going to be angled toward in terms of its content and in terms of its aims and objectives uh, so that's a big debate, even among, uh, you know, non-Muslims, when we talk about what the role of a professor is, especially what the role of a professor is when we talk about religious traditions. Um, and so that I think is, is a kind of area where you see this issue of like ethics and what's the role of that, of the scholar. And I think the problem in, in the, the Western Academy is there's a lot of schizophrenia about what universities are supposed to do, but what professors are supposed to do. And I'm not going to be able to resolve that in this talk or, you know, this is a bigger issue, which has you know, a bigger issue probably in our society overall. Um, now, in terms of like how I, how do I think about this? Um, I try to be very clear about when I'm doing what, right? So a lot of my, let's say if I write a book, I might write a book and let's say like this Islam and blackness book. So I might write and in large segments of the book, just be describing historical processes and analyzing things. And these are different schools of thought that emerged and this school of thought said A and this school of thought said B, right? And then at the end, I might say, I think X and this is why I think X and now I'm gonna make an argument for that. But that, in my opinion, that's very clearly, that's very clear in the book. Like it's very clear that now the author is gonna tell you what he thinks and he's going to make his argument and you can take that and you could just not read that chapter or you can leave it out or you can criticize it but it's very different from the rest of the book so that's what i try to do in my work and in my writing is to be both uh kind of descriptive and analytical uh and able to shift perspectives for the sake of the reader and the students but then also not be afraid to give my own views um when i think it's appropriate um, and this will be my final question, and then we'll open up to the Q&A. So when you were writing your last two books, which is on Islam and slavery, and then on blackness, I mean, I'm sure you're aware that these subject areas were going to be controversial for an academic in this current climate, but you were still willing to engage in that subject area. What was it that drove you to, to say, you know what, 
I find this subject area interesting. I know I'm going to get some heat from this subject area, but this is what I want to put out there. This is what I want to contribute to the conversation. And this is generally what I think um, I should be permitted to do. What was the, the reasoning behind you willing to do that? Because we both know that you have taken heat from some of these subject areas. People sometimes don't understand what academics are saying. Um, and there's, we have to continuously clarify yeah. ourselves, even within academic settings. I mean, I think that, you know, on a slavery topic, what I actually was motivated to write the book because of heat I had taken before I wrote the book. Like, I didn't intend to write a book on slavery and Islam or anything like that. I mean, it was because it was, you know, it was because I, of what I saw in the way that academics dealt with the topic and the way that the broader American society was dealing with the issue of slavery. Like that's, I was, I was so, my, I was so stunned by what I consider to be like amazing cog levels of cognitive dissonance that that I was like, I need to, to explain, I need to explain why I need to look into this. And if I'm correct, I need to explain why I think uh, this issue is such as, you know, it's such and such a thing. Right. So it was more like, I wanted to, I was driven to do it because of, what I thought were real failings in the way that scholars and general public square discussions on this issue worked in the world that, you know, in the, in the, in the Amer in America, basically in the broader West and even maybe globally. So uh, then the blackness book really came out of, it was in some ways an extension of the slavery book. Like I had my own questions still lingering from that, but also it was because of the, what I saw, um, happening amongst scholars like they were scholars who were writing you know professional historians who are historians at really good universities in the west writing in academic journals that islam at a religion at as a religion like at its scriptural basis was anti-black and i was like what the heck is this you know how can somebody say this about or my my religion right and, but also like, here's the evidence they're giving. And if I can't address that evidence, then I just need to show. So what was happening was people weren't addressing the evidence. Muslims or people who were defending Islam against us would just be like, that's wrong. Or, you know, that's, and then they would tell like a essentially fairy tale about Islamic history where no one was racist and everything was great, et cetera, et cetera. And they weren't actually able to deal with the evidence that was given by these people who are arguing that Islam is anti-Black at a scriptural and kind of historical normative level. And so I, what I want to do is really go and, and address all of these issues comprehensively. So that's what I, I did. And by the way, when you talk about getting crowd, like people, the people who give, who, who attack well, at least attack me. They don't actually read anything I write. Like they know, no one, no one. If someone actually reads my books and criticizes me, I would be happy. I would be, I'd be like, that's great. Like I'm so honored that you read my book. Like that's really, really flattered. But people don't do that. They just go, you wrote a book and you're you're a jerk and you said this and you're obviously a slavery apologist or you're racist and then that's it. Like that's just the level of discussion. So it's kind of. I mean, it it, it hurts because you'll get, you know, 2000 people tell, telling you this on Twitter or something, but it doesn't hurt in the sense that no, none of those people have actually ever read anything that I've written. So I, I, I'm like, I, it just, it sort of, uh, you, you sort of doesn't really, there's no uh, substance. Uh, thank you. Actually, you know, I was gonna continue, but I, I know that I don't wanna take up time for everyone who's here. So um, from my perspective, I just want to say thank you very much for engaging with some of the questions that I've asked you. Um, I can honestly say that I wish we had more time in which we can pick your brain a bit more. But the reason why I sort of appreciate this format to some degree is often we get scholars talking on the technicalities of the work that they do, but very little, of, we don't often get the opportunity to just get the insight behind the thought process of what it is that they they were going through while they were doing the work they were doing. So that was basically my intention here. So thank you very much for engaging with me in that sense, Jonathan. I do apologize. My pleasure. Anytime. I'm happy to come back. And even Great. in person, I would love to come next time oh, I'm in Istanbul. Yeah. You all. Uh, if, if when you come down to Istanbul, please pay us a visit. 
And I do want to apologize as, as well that I may have rudely interrupted you on a few occasions, so I apologize for that. No, 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 it's not, not rude. Okay, okay, go ahead. Where are the questions? Let's hear questions. Yes. So for the Q and A, so in the Q and A section, anyone who's interested in asking John, Professor Brown a question, please do raise your hand so that we can see it, and then we will pick in order. Um, and if you want to write your question, please feel free to do that as well. The floor is open. Okay, I have to do it like this so I can see. And if there's, I'm not very good at it. Either. Okay, let's. Okay, there's a question from Elif Yalchin. Uh, she says, Asalaamu Alaikum, I have a specific question. I want to hear Professor Brown's opinion about the hadith related to women being deficient in intelligence and religion. Oh, okay, fair enough. All right, Jonathan, over to you. Okay, why don't you, why don't, why don't people ask a few questions and I can answer them. It usually takes, it's usually more efficient. So that's one. What about the next one? What a, Who's next? Mehmet Fati Arslan has his hand up. Maybe. That's, that's right. Maybe, do you know what? Actually, before we go to Mehmet Fati Hoja, we will probably ask a, a, a question. Why don't you answer this one? Because I think that's the last one in the written format. And then we can do it like that. Okay. Yeah. So the, the Hadith Nakasat Akhtar Wadin is, it's really interesting. Like I've been writing on this, I've been doing research on this for like three years. I, Someone asked me this question. I was going to write something on it, and like I'd spend three years of doing research on it. Uh, it's. I'll tell you why this is a. I find this really challenging. Okay, so one argument. So basically, everybody knows a hadith, right? So the Prophet Salam, comes out and tells these women he's preaching. And he preaches. He goes and tells these women specifically, given charity, uh, because um uh you uh you're in not knock us out Akhlawadi, like you have deficient deficient in your intellect and your religion and then if someone says like, what what about my how is this and she said well don't you women not pray some of the time because they're menstruating and isn't um the uh so that's in religion and isn't like the testimony of one woman worth that of uh you know two women worth that of one man so that's intellect right and there's also different versions that are uh, kind of blend in with one another, like about the prophet saying that um, uh, women are the majority of people in hellfire, or that women, um, that wives um, are sort of cursing their husbands a lot and they're ungrateful to their husbands, um, which by the way is maybe one of the most accurate, has one of the most accurate sentences ever included in the history of, of of humanity which i'm sure i'm gonna get in trouble for saying but i he says you know right so if the, even if the husband's like always good to his wife if he makes one mistake then the wife says i've never seen anything good <laughs> you've never done anything good for me right i i'm willing to bet that this has been heard by many people in the world um, based on what I've heard, I've never heard it myself, to be very clear. Uh, no one's ever said spoken like this to me because, you know, everybody, my, you know, anyway, you guys know what I'm saying. So the point is that uh, this is very, uh, th this is very controversial number of reasons. Okay, first of all, why is the Prophet Salam, saying that essentially, um, menstruation is not is a nox nox right so why if, if if women didn't menstruate then humans wouldn't be born so that's like it seems weird to say that it's like a deficiency when it's 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 clearly like part of how god designed us and it's absolutely essential for our species correct so and there is some wording in the versions of the hadith that i find i haven't really like analyze this fully but strikes me as interesting because it 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 suggests that there's more going on in what the prophet's saying than what seems he seems to be saying but i'm not sure exactly what it is so i don't want to say anything um the second thing is that 
the the idea of one woman's testimony being worth half a man's is clearly not about their intellect because there's all sorts of other areas in which women are intellectually just treated exactly the same as men, right? Um, and even you see this with Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim and when they talk about this and they say like, this has nothing to do with witnessing. This has, this has to do with, you know, to ham to shahada, like essentially not, being a notary and what is considered, you know, authoritative in one society over another. He said in, in, in actual rational capacity, men and women are, or, you know, there's no, like, there could be a really smart woman and a really stupid man, a really stupid woman, a really smart man. Like there's no, doesn't break down along gender lines. So uh, now, now, let, now here's the other thing. Like, let's say that we, that this hadith had been like mis misinterpreted or something. Or let's say this, it's not, I don't think it's true, but let's say that this hadith actually was unreliable. We, we have this revelation, like, oh my God, we looked at the Isnad. It turns out this hadith is totally unreliable. I'm not saying this. I, just want, I want to be clear. I'm just saying, let's say we saw, we saw that. It still wouldn't solve our problem because if you look in the like Medheb's reasoning, they'll frequently cite this hadith as evidence for why they come with a certain rule. So even if the, let's say the hadith was either false or had been misunderstood, it's already been built into, baked into certain reasoning on Medheb issues. Now, you could say that, um, okay, now, for example, Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid Ramadan Abuti, rahimahullah, says um, in one of his books that this thing the Prophet said was sort of like a joke, which act actually is pretty convincing. I think that actually makes sense to me because it's not clear, again, why you would say that menstruation is a nux. Like, it's sort of, he's like almost like teasing the women a little bit. He's talking to them, like, you know, as, as often people would do, you know, when they're talking to people, like kind of teasing them and having fun with them a little bit as, as he's teaching them. Um, but then that raises two questions. One, um, the, I mean, if the prophet is, at least that's not, is joking, but medheb rules were built on this joke then we have an issue which is how do we explain the prophet joking when his words are the basis for rulings so shouldn't he not be joking and then also if he was joking the medhebs had built rules based on a joke right so <laughs> um so that that i think there's like so many issues around this hadith that i it's like a you know a extremely you know, and I don't want to say a not, but there's just a lot of like uh, ramifications for, you know, going back and looking at things you have to deal with, like what that would mean, what's the, what would the consequence of that be? Uh, how would you deal with those consequences? So that's why it's taking me so long to look into this because it's such a fraught issue. And I, when people ask me about this hadith, I dread it because I don't have an easy answer, unfortunately. I just tried to give you an insight into like some of the things I've found around this hadith. Thanks for that. So, Sumeya Hoja did have a hand up, which I missed. So, I'm, oh, I apologize for that. So, Sumeya Hoja, you can go first. And then Mehmet Fatah Hoja can go next. And then I think that will be it for a lot. So, um, please, for, no, Sumeya Hoja? You okay? Okay, then. Uh, is Mehmet Fatah Hoja here? He's also, we've lost him as well. So, it looks like. Um, Hoja, we have a question in the return from the if you want to. Do you want to read it up? You feel free. Amel, I can read it. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So you said being Muslim is not a liability, it is a massive asset. In what way ways would a similar statement of being Christian or Jewish differ? I mean, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, like, so I mean, I think obviously that being that believing in the God is an asset. Like, <laughs> I mean, the so belief in, in the creator is an asset. Um, in terms of scholarship. I'd say, you know, it's, it depends. Like, I think if you were to someone like Thomas Aquinas or Maimonides or someone like that, you know, they um, embody a lot of the same strengths and traditions of excellence and the combination of like memorization and analytical rigor that I think Ijahid has this one uh, line. He says, the 
إذا نكح الفكر والحفظ ولد العجيب. So when kind of thought and and memory mates, wondrous things are born from this, you know. Um, so, but here's the thing: like, there's, I just don't think that the Islamic intellectual tradition has any peer. It doesn't. I mean, and you see that, you know, um, it's interesting. Muslims actually write about this. Even uh, Abu Talib al Mekki in his Qut al Qalub, he writes about this. He says that, you know, we're the only community that memorizes scripture word for word. And then we're the only community that has an isnad back to the founding of the religion. Like other traditions don't have an isnad back to revelation and the, the possessor of revelation. And he brings up, he talks about the Torah and he talks about like the oral transmission of the rabbis. But he says this does not go back to the, to, to like, they can't trace this back to Moses in the way that we can trace our teachings back to the Prophet. So I think that the no tradition has the volume and the kind of volume and high standards, general high standards that the Islamic one does, as far as I know, uh, at least not in the, the pre-modern world. Um, yeah, but I mean, that's in some ways of, um, yeah, uh, that's how I would answer it. Thank you. Um, let's see if there's any more questions. Uh, I'm not really good at navigating Zoom, to be honest with you. Anyone else? Someone can raise. I don't see any hands raised. Who's going to raise a hand? Okay, from Ashraf. Would you recommend academia in the U.S., for example, as a core path to gain knowledge about the faith? No, definitely not. No, no, no. I, I, I say this regularly. Don't know. You don't don't learn about Islam. If you want to learn about your religion, do not go to a U.S. university. Do not. In fact, you'll probably end up learning the opposite. You'll probably end up getting up. You know becoming disenchanted or something so go find qualified scholars in teachers and where you live or online and then this is a way to learn uh mehmed yeah. fati arslan okay go for it okay thank you very much for letting me at least I guess I am not interrupted the third time, right? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for the pollution behind me because I was on my way, just arrived at home. I couldn't miss this uh, speech. So I have one comment and one question. Um, as you already stated that you said that you are not interested in someone who is trying to uh, force for um, or questions for authenticity of hadith. And I totally agree with this. I think according to Islamic sciences hierarchy, hadith even doesn't have to bother about it because it's not hadith domain to substantiate that or justify that prophet was already alive. And then he said this and that, and then he was really prophet of God. This, this is domain of ilm al ilahi, whether you Islamic theology, whether you name it kalam or uh, philosophy. Um, anyway, somewhere else. So if someone is looking for this kind of question, he has to look for somewhere else in my understanding of hadith. And then uh, the other question is that you told that there are many academicians, especially like who are uh, at least at a certain level of proficiency in their job and they are uh, um, smearing Islam, saying that, well, Islam in its core uh, anti-Black or racial or um, I don't know, um, at least has a certain backbone of uh, racial statement and Quran includes this kind of thing. My question is that, do you think that this is a, a, like a, an attempt coming from an, uh, actually from a bad intention or coming from ignorance? Like it, we used to have like uh, academicians who are non-Muslim working, which we call Orientalists who were really uh, has a depth of knowledge in Islamic studies, someone like Shah or Godzir. But in these days, you can hardly find someone who is well educated in Islamic studies rather than they are will, they will work on uh, Islam in America, sex, gender, racial statements. So do you think that is this a currency on Islamic studies, like down leveling it rather than focusing on really actually what is in Islamic studies in its essence? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, at least on these. So I think when you look at the issue of you know Islam and slavery and Islam and blackness, uh, these the things you're describing. I well, like anything, right? Um, if there's a let's say there's a politician who says something, you know, he might have intentions, but you know the regular people who are following them don't you know they're they, they're ignorant right so they're just ignorant and they're just following somebody who says something right but um so there's yeah there's a lot of ignorance but i think at the, the where where these issues are generated it's definitely intentional and it's its sources are, are clear it's, its sources are extremely clear right it comes from uh basically um western what you might call like western supremacists who want to focus on Islam and slavery and Islam as oppressive to black people because it helps Western societies, especially America, um, uh, um, uh, exonerate itself from or distract other people from its own uh, legacy of slavery and racism. So that's one thing. The other thing is uh, a kind of uh, some aspects of African American society, especially Christians, and then sharing actually uh sending that back and now like in a kind of dialogic relationship with uh christians in places like nigeria where there's this whole idea of vilifying muslims as not part of africa as oppressive as not indigenous to like quote unquote africa right uh and then the third is basically american conservatism i'm essentially like aggressive uh, american conservative foreign policy and then also, and this is I simply demonstrably true, uh, Israeli uh, foreign policy propaganda, essentially Hasbar, right? Israeli foreign pu public diplomacy, which has, which sees this as a way to one split third, quote unquote, third world solidarity, so split kind of Arabs and Muslims away from Africans, and then say that the real people who are racist aren't the Israelis, it's the Arabs and the Palestinians. They're the real racists. See how that much they hate black people. So they, this is, uh, I think I demonstrate this all very clearly in my recent book. I have a whole chapter on this. Kamal Sani Bawa. Unmute, unmute, unmute Kamal. Uh oh, Kamal's having technical problems. Hey, back. Go on, Kamal. Maybe you can be the writers. Yeah. Okay, okay, talk. Go ahead. Yeah. Good day. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. I'm joining here from Nigeria. Unfortunately, I I came late uh, because of the time factor. So mine, I have a question um, based on what I have read on the topic on hadith. Of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I think the talk, the main idea of the talk, is based on the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Am I right? Uh, this talk today? No, this is more about my own uh, my own life and work, which is okay. seems I it seems kind of self indulgent, uh, but uh, that's what they asked me to turn around. I mean, I'm just answering questions. I don't know what to do. Yes, I'm very self-involved, I suppose. So, uh, Kamal, you may not have missed, what you missed yeah. may not have been as valuable as you thought. So I recommend, if you're interested in this, and you wanna know what yeah. I have to say about it, you can read my book, Hadith, Muhammad's Legacy in the Medieval Modern World, okay. with, uh, with the red cover. If you can't get a copy in Nigeria, email me, I'll send you a copy. Okay. Or my book, Misquoting Muhammad, and my book, Islam and Slavery, which are all, I think, good books. Okay, maybe okay. I uh, Ashraf, sorry, go ahead. So maybe I can share my email so that I can be able to have a copy. Yeah, yeah. Email, yeah. you can e just email, uh, give your email in the chat. Yeah. So thank you very okay. much. Maybe in the process now, I will be joined in the process. I might have some questions later time. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Ashraf. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just a, and then just a, yeah. Uh, Ashraf, go for it. Just to follow up on my question about uh, studying in an academic situation, because as you know, it's very difficult to 
I guess in the modern world to gain knowledge in terms of um, you know, having access to shiuch or more importantly, having access to a specific curriculum and going through sort of a tertib of, you know, attaining knowledge. So my question, I guess, was how do you like, how, how, how do you see as a, a way forward for Muslims in terms of gaining knowledge? And then more importantly, in terms of like passing that on or practicing uh, that, do you, do you think that it's sufficient? So for example, you went, like you mentioned uh, at the beginning of your talk, you went to the Azhar and, and, and you met with people such as, you know, Sayyid Shadud and um, uh, Osama Sayyid al-Azhari and um, uh, th th these people who, they have a, a very research and academic rigor to them as well. And, um, you know, they were sort of doing it ad hoc with, with Sheikh Ali Juma. Um, but how is that, how is that something that can be sort of replicable and sustainable um, in terms of how we function as Muslims, like, all, I guess, all over the world in terms of how we take the knowledge and how we, how, you know, how we, how we would tra transmit that. Um, because it just seems, it, it just seems to me from like my experiences as well, it's just sort of, it's just done so haphazardly and you have to do a private study here or you have to just look into finding a good teacher there. There's no really like at an institutional level to sort of um, attain, attain knowledge and then again, pass it on to, to you know, yeah. the, next, the next generation. I mean, I think unfortunately, I mean, one, I think that there actually are a, a lot of, of sort resources, you know, if you live, you know, if you're lucky, and if you live in Dallas, for example, there's Cullum Seminary. There's actually a lot of good institutes in in um, around the world. Uh, Darul Alooms, there's a lot of really good Darul Alooms, you know, from South Africa to Canada to the UK to the United States, right? So, um, I think that people, you know, if you really if you want to go and get like a basic grounding in Islamic sciences. It's uh, there are in, there are institutions, you know, and if you can't get there, then you can watch lectures, lectures online. I mean, there's so the Internet. I mean, it sounds I sound like kind of stupid and old saying this, but like the Internet has really made so many things available to us. Like you can uh, watch lectures by really great scholars, even whole lectures, even like doing a whole shah of the Muatta or the shah of some Maliki. You can watch the whole thing, you know, as if you were there. Uh, yeah, you can't answer, ask questions, but other people are asking questions and they're getting answered and maybe your questions are going to get answered in the process. And just that, that's an incredible resource. Now, of course, the issue there is a lot of the stuff is based on language. Uh, it, definitely knowing Arabic is really important for a lot of it or Urdu, but certainly Arabic. So, um, but that, you know, and then it's just a matter of learning language and there's a lot of resources for that as well. Uh, so I think that it's not as, yeah, it's always hard to find great minds and to learn from them. But that's going to be hard no matter where you are in the world and no matter when. Uh, but we have more access to them now through the internet than we, we I think, ever have in the past. Folks, I, unfortunately, I have to go. Um, but I, if you have questions, you can email me. And if I don't reply, then email me again. And if I don't reply, email me again. Don't, don't, I might I promise that you are going to answer the emails. I get a lot of emails. I, I forget about things. Um, okay, Jonathan, thank you very much for your time and your energy and effort. We really do appreciate it. Inshallah, I'll get to speak to you soon again. Inshallah, when you come to Istanbul, it'll be great to have you over at the department. That would be fantastic. I would love to. Thank, thank you very much. I really okay, do. Okay, like everybody. Awesome. And as for everyone, presenting on Islam and Bosnia. And then um, Dr. Ovami Anjum, who will be talking about uh, the constitution of Medina. So please do uh, stay in contact with our socials and uh, um, remain connected and we'll put up the details online, inshallah. Thank you very much everyone for being here today. We really appreciate it. And this is just the beginning of the new semester. So hopefully we can continue to do that. So please pray that this is successful and uh, thank you very much. Take care and uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you.